If you're shopping for a small crossover that doesn't break the bank in America, there are suddenly a ton of options, and the newest of them is this all-new Kia Seltos. Kia was a brand that didn't have too many crossovers for a while, but has all of a sudden completely exploded with crossover models. We have the Is It A Crossover Kia Soul that is front-wheel drive and very boxy, also less expensive than the Seltos. Then we have this model, which competes sort of kind of with the Honda HRV, CHR, and logically the Jeep Compass as well. Then we have the Kia Sportage, which is a direct RAV4 and CRV competitor, the Sorento, which is a direct Highlander competitor, and then the Telluride, if the Highlander is simply not big enough for you. And that's before we even talk about the Kia Nero, which is almost the same size as this, but is it a crossover? Whatever it is, it's a hybrid and has a hatchback. With so many crossovers in their lineup, there is obviously a decent amount of pricing overlap. The Seltos starts at $21,990, but it tops out just about $29,000. So it doesn't go as high as some of the competition, but it doesn't go as low either. If you're looking for something under $22,000, that's where the Kia Soul plays, or of course, something like the Kia Nero, because the Nero is available with hybrid or plug-in hybrid drivetrains, also an EV, again, very complicated lineup. The main reason for bringing the Seltos to America is that the Soul does not have all-wheel drive, and most versions of the Seltos will. In fact, there's only one trim of the Seltos that comes front-wheel drive, and that's the base model, but making things even more complicated, there's also a base model with all-wheel drive. And no, I don't mean a base model with optional all-wheel drive, I mean a model that is exactly the same base price with all-wheel drive, or there's one without all-wheel drive. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Up front, the look is certainly more crossover looking than the Soul as well, a little bit more in line with the Kia Telluride. This is not the direct cross, however, to the Hyundai Kona. Some have just assumed that this is the Kia Kona. That's not the case. Although they are distantly related, the closest relative to this is the Hyundai iX25, also known as the Creta in some world markets. That definitely looks different than this. It has a really cool interior. I wish Hyundai would bring that to the US, but until then, we have this model. We have the same sort of divorced headlamp look that we see in some of the other modern Hyundai and Kia models, but they're a lot closer together. So this is the headlamp module here. These are the turn signals right up here. They are separate modules separated by this satin strip right there. We have fog lamps down below in the model that we're looking at. Going in for a closer look, you can see that the grille certainly has a stronger look to it than we find in the sole. And the accent light that runs right across the front goes all the way to this point, so just barely misses this tiger nose section right there. And then we have some rugged looking treatment down here at the bottom. This is not actually a skid plate. This is not metal. This is just plastic. The plastic treatment certainly makes things look more rugged from the front, but from this angle you can really see that ground clearance is not as high as some. So this is not a direct replacement to some of those more off-road oriented Jeep models. Ground clearance comes in at 7.3 inches. That is significantly above the Nero or the Soul, but it is below the Crosstrek, the 500X, and the Jeep Compass. The rugged look continues around the side where we definitely have a very boxy profile. This reminds me a little bit of some BMW or perhaps even Land Rover models. We have some body cladding right down here. You can tell they were definitely trying to keep the styling in line with the large Kia Telluride. At 172 inches long, this is on the long end of the subcompact crossover segment. Classifications don't mean much anymore apparently, so call this whatever you want it, whether you want to call it a compact or a subcompact crossover, it depends on where you are in the world. Any way you slice it, this is seven inches longer than the Kia Soul. But because Kia has so many different vehicles in their crossover lineup, there's really a crossover for everybody out there. This is a tweener vehicle, sort of like the Jeep Compass and perhaps maybe like the Crosstrek. So this is longer than something like a Honda HRV or of course those really small crossovers but it is shorter than something like a CRV or RAV4, so it's gonna be easier to park. The model that Kia sent us is not the top end trim. This is one down from that. This is the S turbocharged trim. So you can see that we have 235 with 18 inch tires on this model, unique wheels, and the little red hubcap in the middle. I really like that touch. A number of years ago, Kia decided to go out on a limb and start hiring German designers away from companies like BMW and Audi. And I think that's really paid off in their design. The Seltos is very attractive from the front and from the back. Unfortunately, some of those German styling cues do seem to have tagged along like these fake exhaust vents right down here at the bottom of the bumper. They always look a little silly to me. I wish they had just given us a single boring exhaust tip on one side, even if it wasn't chrome or anything like that. These just strike me as a little funny and they are a little bit difficult to clean. Really digging in there into those cross hatched crevices is kind of a pain. Again, a key reason to get the Seltos over the sole is the availability of all wheel drive. That's also a logical reason to buy this over something like the Toyota CHR, which is front wheel drive only as well. 
This is where we should explain the dual base model. Basically what Kia says is that you can get all wheel drive or you can get front wheel drive and more stuff on the inside for the same price, basically just under $22,000 before a destination. Aside from that, every other Seltos will have all wheel drive. Another logical reason to get the Seltos over some of the competition is for extra power. The base engine comes in at 146 horsepower. It is mated to a CVT and it will give you 29 miles per gallon if you choose all wheel drive, 31 if you choose front wheel drive and the extra stuff on the inside. Those fuel economy numbers may be a little bit below some of the competition, but we do get more power than some of the less powerful options, something along the lines of the Nissan Kicks, for instance. And if you want more power, there is more power on offer, but oddly enough, not quite as much power as is on offer in the Kona or in the Kia Soul. Because while we do have a version of the corporate 1.6 liter turbocharged engine under here, it produces 175 horsepower, not over 200 like we find in the Soul. Torque comes in at 195 pound-feet of torque, and this is mated to the same seven-speed dual-clutch transmission that we find in a lot of those other vehicles. Obviously, fuel economy is going to take a little bit of a hit with the 1.6 liter turbo, but thanks to the dual clutch transmission, it's not as far as you might think. And of course, all wheel drive is standard on the turbo engine because again, all other trims except for that one base model have all wheel drive. When it comes to active safety, Kia is going about things a little bit differently than Toyota and Honda. The base trim will either have or not have some of the active safety tech that we have on this model. Again, this is that split base model deal. So if you choose front wheel drive, then we get the autonomous emergency braking, collision warning, lane keeping assistance, the aggressive lane following, and attention monitoring. But if you get the base trim with all wheel drive, then you don't get those features. If you want blind spot monitoring, you'll find that in the EX trim and higher. We have that on this model but radar adaptive cruise control is not available in any trim of Seltos. And I do think that's a shame because it is available in some of the competition. As I usually mention when we review vehicles with dual clutch transmissions, remember that the transmission in this guy is a manual transmission essentially inside that is being shifted by robot. Really technically it's two manual transmissions, but the key thing here is that it will feel like a manual transmission under certain driving conditions. So you're gonna get that sort of clutch shutter as you start off in some situations. And if you decide to take this vehicle a little bit off the beaten path, more rugged off-roading, you are going to notice that the transmission can end up overheating. You've probably seen some of those videos online as well. But in normal day-to-day -day driving situations, the main reason we have a DCT is for fuel economy. It's more efficient than a traditional automatic transmission, and that's exactly why we find it under this hood. And it's more engaging than the base CVT. So if I were choosing an engine, this is definitely the one that I would get. Jumping into the front seat, I found these seats very comfortable for my body shape, but I am gonna have to give these eight out of 10 points because we don't have a power seat even in this S turbo trim. This is second from the top. I would have loved to have seen a power seat design. We also don't have any adjustable lumbar support. I do find it properly positioned for me, but keep in mind, if you're bigger or taller or shorter than I am, then this may not be the right fit for you. So definitely spend some time in the seat. But for me at six feet tall, I found these seats to be quite good. One of the most comfortable in this segment. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion and quite logically a manual passenger seat as well. Something that I've noted in a lot of Kia and Hyundai vehicles is that it's clear that this vehicle was designed for taller folks because the seat track really moves quite far rearward. The seat goes pretty close to the floor and I have probably about four and a half inches of headroom left. So if you're a taller person, but you're looking for a smaller crossover, this may be a little bit more accommodating than some of those other options. The Seltos not being a Kia Kona is a good thing, and you'll notice that when we hop into the back seats, we find definitely a more accommodating rear seat area and more legroom. But oddly enough, even though this is bigger than a Kia Soul, we have just a hair less combined legroom. That's because the Soul is so boxy. You will notice that sitting right there behind myself. I have about four inches of legroom or so, certainly enough to carry four adults. And interestingly enough, at the launch of the Seltos, we definitely had four adults in here for quite a lot of time. I was wandering around with Sophie and Bay from Redline Reviews, his videographer, my videographer, and me. We were all in the vehicle and we had absolutely no problem. One of the areas where the Seltos does really well is rear headroom. If I lean back here towards the headrest, I have about two inches of headroom left, and that is quite generous. Now, keep in mind, this is still a subcompact vehicle, so it's going to be narrower than a CRV or a RAV4 or Kia Zone Sportage, and that means that we don't have a rear bench that is quite as wide. However, I still could put three of me back here if I needed to to take a trip to lunch. I have about an inch of headroom left right there. And if I scoot all the way over to the right side of the vehicle where this front seat was all the way back in its tracks, I have about an inch of legroom left. 
Also a bit of a surprise, the rear seats have a two-stage recline mechanism to them. Uh, admittedly, this is not a lot of recline. This is the most reclined position, and this is the most upright position, but it's a feature that I hadn't expected. The Seltos is full of interesting and thoughtful touches, like a little slot right here on the door where you can insert the buckle for the seat belt. If you've ever found yourself folding and then relatching the seats back into position and getting the seat belt stuck in the latch, then this is the solution to that problem. Also a nice touch for an inexpensive vehicle is a soft touch armrest right back here on the rear door, although the rest of the door, the entire rest of the door, is made from hard plastic. And lastly, before we move on, the center seat belt position comes out of the seat back itself, not out of the ceiling. That definitely is a better design because it means that when this seat is folded, you don't have some weird bump right back here that's going to affect your cargo area. Behind the manual hatch, we find 26.6 cubic feet of storage space. This is above the Kia Soul, but it's not as far above the Kia Soul as you might think because the Soul is definitely squarer than this. You'll notice that even though this has a pretty vertical hatch, it does lean forwards a little bit right there. That puts the Seltos in terms of cargo capacity just below the Jeep Compass, but oddly enough, above the Jeep Cherokee. Thanks to the lowering load floor, the Seltos did very well in our 24-inch roller bag test, and there's even enough room under there to put a full-size spare tire if you wanted to do that aftermarket. That has a donut in there at the moment, but the 235 with tires on our model would certainly fit under there if you needed them to. Oddly enough, 235 with tires are the widest tires available on a Toyota RAV4, which is one full-size above this. Something I found odd, however, back here is that we don't have a cargo cover, not a roller style, not a fixed style, nothing like that. We do have some little knobbies right here on the hatch, but I don't see anywhere else to dock a cargo cover aftermarket. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the S turbo trim, which is not the top end trim, but it is one down from the top. So obviously there are going to be things in here that we don't find on the base trim, but there are also going to be a few things on that SX turbo trim that we don't have on here. We do have hydro adjustable shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests. The front and rear seats are upholstered in a combination of imitation leather and fabric upholstery. If we zoom in on there, you can see that we do have a somewhat asymmetrical design, some lines that exist just on one side and then not on the other. Bolstering is not terribly aggressive on the seat bottom cushion. It's a little bit more aggressive on the seat back cushion, but larger and smaller folks shouldn't have any problem fitting in these seats. Moving over to the front doors, again, keep in mind that we are in an inexpensive vehicle, so there's a lot of hard plastic going on on the door. The upper section of that door panel where you might want to rest your arm is hard. We then have a soft insert right here in the middle and then a soft touch armrest, and then the entire rest of the door is made from harder plastics, for instance, around that bottle holder down there at the bottom. Now, if we go in for a closer look, nobody has kicked in these speaker grills. That is all part of the design. I think it's a little bit unusual. I might get used to it, but it does strike me as looking like somehow a metal speaker crate that has been bent, especially those tweeter speaker grills right there above that. Moving over to the dashboard, Kia has injected a little bit of color here, which I do like. This is a dark blue insert. It kind of looks purple over there, but the whole thing is actually blue and it has a texture to it, but it is a hard plastic, just like the upper section of the dashboard is a hard plastic, as well as the lower portion of the dashboard right there around that bin style glove compartment. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside there, but that's not too much of a problem because it looks like we have a large tablet right here in the center of the dashboard. This is a standard touchscreen infotainment system. It does support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's running basically the same software that we see in the rest of the Hyundai and Kia vehicles. We don't have factory navigation in this trim, but this is one of my favorite infotainment systems because it's pretty simple. It's very snappy as well. It doesn't have all the features that we find in some of the competition, but it seems to be pretty reliable. We have two large air vents below that, manual climate control here, single zone. We also have an actual key here in this trim, in case you're wondering, no start button. So if you're looking for a vehicle with the key and manual climate control and a turbocharged engine, this is gonna be one of your options. If I move the shifter back, you'll notice that we have two charge ports there, no wireless charging areas, but there is a shelf for you to store your smartphone right there above that. The drive mode is adjusted via the knob to the left of the shifter. We rotate it around for the three different drive modes, normal, smart, and sport. We then have controls for the heated seats, driver seated seat, passenger heated seat, hill descent control, and then this little button right over here is the all-wheel drive lock button that tells the center coupling to be more aggressive at lockup, but it does not appear to command a complete lockup like we do see in some other Kia vehicles out there, so it seems to be a little bit less aggressive than them. This is a pretty traditional console shifter. Drive is all the way back there. Sport mode over to the left. We can then toggle up and down for manual gear changes. Behind the gear shifter, we find two large cup holders right there and a handbrake if you prefer that over one of the electric varieties or a foot operated one. We then have a padded center armrest, which we can open up to reveal a pretty decently sized storage compartment. 
As with much of the interior, the instrument cluster feels like a scaled down version of something that you'd find in another Kia product. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You can see that we have physical dials there. And then in the middle, we have a monochromatic multifunction display. The display gets the job done, but I do wish that Kia had given us a little bit of a schnazzier display, perhaps a larger color LCD, something along those lines. We have our typical trip computer readouts, the status of the vehicle's active safety systems, as well as the all-wheel drive system, and this is where you change certain vehicle settings. The steering wheel is a round three-spoke design, no paddle shifters on the back, but we do have sport grips up top. On the right side of the wheel, we have the buttons for the regular cruise control system. Again, no adaptive cruise controls available. But we do have Kia's more aggressive lane centering assist here, which is kind of a surprise. These buttons relate to that multifunction LCD. And then on the left side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system, as well as some dedicated phone hang up and pick up buttons. Thanks to the turbocharged engine under the hood, acceleration is definitely swifter than most of the competition. This model ran 0 to 60 in 7 seconds flat. This is again the S Turbo model with the 7 speed dual clutch transmission and of course all wheel drive, which is standard. The 0 to 60 time is likely helped out by the all wheel drive system because we do get a reasonable amount of low end torque. You can really feel that off the line that this has nearly 200 pound feet of torque on tap. Thankfully, a dealer was able to provide us with a 2-liter all-wheel drive model to test 0 to 60 times in, and that model came in at 8.1 seconds, so definitely slower than the model we're driving here, but still faster than something like the Honda HRV in our more recent tests. Stopping distances are also pretty good for this segment. This model came in at 117 feet, 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's thanks to the wider 235 with tires that we have on this model. If you get the base version of the Seltos, expect those distances to stretch out a little bit longer. When it comes to handling, the Seltos does really well for itself. This is not going to feel as neat and as tidy as a sedan or some of the subcompact hatchbacks that are out there that are closer to the ground but Kia did a really good job tuning the suspension. And of course, we do have those wide tires as well, which certainly help things out. In terms of overall fun to drive, I think this is really quite close to something like the Mazda CX-30, which is an awful lot of fun. Now, in many ways, the Mazda CX-30 is not really a true subcompact crossover because like the Subaru Crosstrek, it is just a jacked up hatchback that is in a class a little bit bigger than this, and that's why it's larger on the outside than the average. But as a result, it gets more power than average in this segment, more power than we find even in this Seltos right here, and a traditional six-speed automatic transmission. I really like that Mazda CX-30, but I think this feels pretty close to it in terms of overall grip out on the road. Now, one thing that I dislike about the CX-30 is that the rear suspension can get pretty upset over broken pavement. And that's because in the current generation of the Mazda 3, they decided not to use an independent suspension in the rear for some reason. The Seltos, on the other hand, feels very composed out on a wide variety of different road surfaces. So when it comes to our overall handling score, I'm certainly going to give this model an A. Obviously, that score is going to drop down if you get the base versions of the Seltos. Out on a rougher gravel road like we're on here, I think that the extra size of the Seltos helps this feel less bobble-heady than some of the really small compact crossovers that we find in America. Vehicles like the Jeep Renegade or the Ford EcoSport have really short wheelbases, and they do feel kind of odd out on some pavement types, because one side of the suspension can't settle itself before that same impact is felt by the other end of the car. Keep in mind again that we are driving the S Turbo trim, which does have those wider 235 with tires. So the ride quality is pretty well done, even in the model with the upgraded tires. Back out on the paved road at 50 miles an hour, we got 73 decibels in this cabin. That's pretty normal for a subcompact crossover, but keep in mind, this is not going to be as quiet or as refined as the next category up. So you will definitely find a quieter cabin, even in a loud option in the compact crossover segment. So something like a RAV4 is not necessarily the quietest entry there, but it is going to be quieter than the Seltos' cabin. Wind noise is very well controlled in the Seltos, but road noise definitely seems to be above average. I think that may have something to do with the tire size, of course, because these are pretty wide tires yet again. I keep saying that, but definitely keep that in mind. 235 with tires are going to make more noise out on the road than, say, 215 or 205 with tires, which you can find on subcompact crossovers. Fuel economy has never really been Kia's forte, but they have been trying to change that over the past few years. And this is one of their attempts. And that's the reason that this engine doesn't produce as much power as we find in other 1.6 liter turbocharged models. 
This is not exactly the same 1.6 liter turbo. This is the newest generation of this engine family and this one is much more focused on fuel efficiency. And that's why we've been averaging 29.5 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. That's pretty impressive for something that's boxy and on the large end of this segment. In terms of the fun to drive competition, fuel economy in this does appear to be better in real world driving than the Mazda CX-30. So if you're trying to compare this to something like that Mazda for the fun to drive nature of the turbo engine, then keep that in mind. However, fuel economy is going to be better in something like the Honda HRV. That lower fuel economy versus the Honda also seems to apply if you get the base two liter engine in this, but it is going to be a little bit faster than that Honda. Bottom line, the Seltos is a surprising amount of fun out on the road. I'm really happy that Kia decided to put a lot of effort into the suspension design and also give us wider tires and the turbocharged engine. For 2020, the Seltos is priced sort of in the middle of the segment at $21,990 starting. And again, there are those two base models, which is really an interesting twist. In addition to the two base models, S and LX, we also basically have two middle trims that are almost exactly the same price. One gives you the two liter naturally aspirated engine and continuously variable transmission, and one gives you the 1.6 liter turbo and dual clutch transmission. But first, let's talk about the difference between the S and LX base trims. The LX gets all wheel drive, the S is front wheel drive, but you get more stuff inside. The things missing from the LX are that we have four color choices only, so a limited color palette. We don't get roof rails, fog lights, LED tail lamps, the heated mirrors, chrome touches on the outside. We also lose some of the soft touch interior components that we see in the model that we were driving. We lose the height adjustable rear headrests and the active safety technologies as well. That includes driver attention monitoring, forward collision warning, pedestrian detection, lane keeping, and auto high beams. But on the other hand, you get all-wheel drive for that same base price. That makes this one of the better all-wheel drive deals in this segment. The other tricky decision happens at around $25,500 because for about that price, you could get, again, either the EX 2.0 with the CVT and all-wheel drive or the 1.6 TS trim with all-wheel drive, which is what we were testing today. As you'd expect, the S trim with the turbo is faster zero to 60, but we do lose some features. We lose the solar glass, the sunroof, LED interior lighting, the upgraded vanity mirrors, leatherette seats, power seats, automatic climate control. We got the manual climate control we were seeing today. Keyless Go is the last thing you lose. Active safety items remain exactly the same between these two models. As much fun as the turbo and DCT are, I suspect I might get the extra bits and bobs on the inside. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. With that out of the way, let's talk about the competition. We're gonna go in order of sales here. The Subaru Crosstrek is the most popular entry, second is the Trax, then the HRV, then the Jeep Renegade. The Crosstrek is kind of an odd duck here because it literally is a Subaru Impreza hatchback that has been lifted and had its price tag tweaked upwards a little bit. At $22,145, it's priced somewhat like the Seltos, but significantly more than the Impreza hatch at $19,195, which is also all-wheel drive standard. Now, the Crosstrek might look like it has a low price, but keep in mind, it doesn't have an automatic transmission standard. It has a manual. Now, if you want a manual transmission, that's going to be a great value, but if you want an automatic transmission, and statistically 95% of you at least do, then it's gonna be more expensive than the Seltos at $23,495. We also don't find the same kind of standard feature content in the Crosstrek for that base model that we find in the base Seltos. It's easy to see why the Crosstrek has become a sales success for Subaru. We have that standard all wheel drive system. It's a great value. And on the surface of things, you might think that being based on an Impreza hatchback would mean less interior room than a boxier crossover like the Seltos. But in fact, we have very similar headroom. And even though the Crosstrek gives up a little bit of cargo room to the Seltos because it's not quite as square in the rear, it's not that far off. The Crosstrek also gives us all wheel drive standard, which is a big factor to a lot of folks that are shopping in the segment. And that's exactly why we see all wheel drive essentially standard in the Seltos as well. There's no turbocharged engine available in the Crosstrek and the base engine isn't exactly quick. However, there is gonna be a new two and a half liter engine available for 2021. We've seen that engine in other Subaru models before. It produces a little over 180 horsepower and that's definitely gonna make it one of the faster entries in the segment. However, I suspect that because it's a naturally aspirated engine, it's probably not going to be as quick as the turbocharged Seltos. It's also going to be found only in the top end trims of the Crosstrek, so the base trims are still going to be slower. Our next competitor sells on its price. The Trax starts at $21,300, and although that doesn't seem like it's less expensive than the Seltos, the reality is it's going to transact at least $4,000 below MSRP. For the last nine months running or so, they've had at least $3,500 off of that Trax. 
without any arguing at all. So you go into the dealer, you're more likely to get a screaming deal on the tracks than you are on a Seltos or a Crosstrek or a Honda HRV. And that puts its realistic price tag well under $20,000 for the base model. The Trax is not exactly a spring chicken. It has been around for a while. It's theoretically been replaced in other world markets, but the old Trax and old Buick Encore are living on in America for a while. They haven't exactly been replaced by the Encore GX and Trailblazer just yet, although I wouldn't be surprised if that happened in 2022. But the big thing, of course, for the Trax is that it's very practical. We have a fold flat front passenger seat, which I think is a great, great option in this segment and we get those fantastic deals. Again, $3,000 to $4,000 off without haggling at all means it is gonna be one of the least expensive entries available. It is likely even going to be less expensive than something like the new Hyundai Venue, which is really targeting very, very low base prices. Next up, we have the Honda HRV at 20,820. This starts out as a decent value, but you'll notice that there are things missing in that base model. We don't have things like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto support. We also don't have the Honda sensing system, which Honda has been really aggressive at pushing out to a lot of their vehicles, but the HRV is not included in the base trims. If you want features like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you'll have to step up into the sport trim for 22,520, but you don't get all wheel drive in that model. If you want all wheel drive, you'll be spending at least $24,000. The main wins for the Seltos over the HRV are that it feels a little bit fresher, both on the inside and outside. I do like the design more than I like the design in the HRV. It's also gonna be a better value with a lower MSRP, more features, and a longer standard warranty than we find on the Honda. It's also gonna be more engaging to drive and definitely faster. The Honda HRV is not exactly swift. Although not everybody is a fan of the mini minivan style that we see in the HRV, it's one of the the best selling options in this segment for a good reason. It's very practical on the inside. We have a huge cargo area, even though the HRV is not one of the larger options in this segment. It comes pretty close to the Kia Seltos while being smaller on the outside, and we get an absolutely enormous amount of legroom for the front seat passengers as well as for the rear seat passengers. Lastly, we have kind of the odd duck in this segment, and that is the Jeep Renegade. The reason the Renegade is a little bit tricky is because even though it is logically the least capable Jeep available in their lineup, it's arguably the most capable in this segment. Jeep decided quite some time ago that when they were designing a new vehicle, it had to really be class leading in terms of off-road ability. But that does mean that the Renegade is not as much fun on-road. It also ends up being a little bit heavier than some of the competition. And of course, it ends up being more expensive as well. That means that value is definitely a strong win for the Seltos. I like the Seltos looks, but I have to admit the Jeep Renegade is really darn cute. The boxy proportions also mean that even though it's one of the smallest vehicles in the segment, it's still pretty practical on the inside. But the Seltos is better to drive on the road, it has more leg room, we have a longer warranty, better value, and it's also likely going to be a bit more reliable than the Jeep Renegade. But picking a winner in this segment is tricky because there are so many great options and a ton of options that we haven't even talked about yet in this video. I suspect that if my own money were on the line, I might lean towards something like the Mazda CX-30. It's a great value. I think it's the prettiest in this segment. The infotainment system is a little bit behind the times. I don't really like the way that Mazda has designed their newest infotainment system. It's not as intuitive to use as the systems that we find in the Renegade or in the Seltos or honestly, even something like the Honda HRV. I'm not the biggest fan of the little control knob. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. The venue is gonna be one of the easiest to park options and it also is a a screaming value. The price tag is kept really low, but there's no all-wheel drive available. It's one of the big things to keep in mind about the Venue, the CHR, the Nissan Kicks, and some of the other options here. Subaru's Crosstrek, on the other hand, has all-wheel drive in all of the options, including the manual transmission version. And so if you're looking for a manual transmission, that's going to be one of the only options available. There's also a plug-in hybrid version of that Crosstrek, which is still a reasonable value. It definitely is really pushing the budget for a small crossover in America, but you're gonna have access to carpool lanes solo in some states, and there are gonna be tax credits and additional incentives depending on when you're buying that. If you don't need all wheel drive, there's a Nissan Kicks that's pretty good value as well. I suspect if my own money were on the line, again, I might lean towards the Mazda CX-30. I think the CX-30 is a great value in this segment. and also is really great looking on the outside. I think the Seltos wins over it in a number of key areas, but the CX-30 is terribly pretty. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And what would you pick if you were shopping in the segment? There are a ton of great options, and I think it's really hard to go wrong with at least the top four or five vehicles that we've been talking about so far. Again, let me know what you think about that down there and I'll see all of you later.